The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. Chapter 19. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. Edited by Frank Woodward Payne. Chapter 19. An Agent of Pennsylvania in London. Our new governor, Captain Denny, brought over for me the before-mentioned medal from the Royal Society, which he presented to me at an entertainment given by the city. He accompanied it with very polite expressions of his esteem for me, having, as he said, been long acquainted with my character. After dinner, when the company, as was customary at that time, were engaged in drinking, he took me aside into another room and acquainted me that he had been advised by his friends in England to cultivate a friendship with me as one who was capable of giving him the best advice and of contributing most effectually to the making of his administration easy, that he therefore desired of all things to have a good understanding with me, and he begged me to be assured of his readiness on all occasions to render me every service that might be in his power. He said much to me, also, of the proprietor's good disposition towards the province, and of the advantage it might be to us all, and to me in particular, if the opposition that had been so long continued to his measures was dropped, and harmony restored between him and the people, in effecting which it was thought no one could be more serviceable than myself, and I might depend on adequate acknowledgments and recompenses, etc., etc. The drinkers, finding we did not return immediately to the table, sent us a decanter of Madeira, which the governor made liberal use of, and in proportion became more profuse of his solicitations and promises. My answers were to this purpose, that my circumstances, thanks to God, were such as to make proprietary favors unnecessary to me, and that being a member of the assembly, I could not possibly accept of any. That, however, I had no personal enmity to the proprietary, and that whatever the public measures he proposed should appear to be for the good of the people, no one should espouse and forward them more zealously than myself, my past opposition having been founded on this, that the measures which had been urged were evidently intended to serve the proprietary interest with great prejudice to that of the people, which I was much obliged to him, the governor, for his profession of regard to me, that he might rely on everything in my power to make his administration as easy as possible, hoping at the same time that he had not brought with him the same unfortunate instructions his predecessor had been hampered with. On this he did not then explain himself, but when he afterward came to do business with the assembly, they appeared again, the disputes were renewed, and I was as active as ever in the opposition, being the penman, first, of the request to have a communication of the instructions, and then of the remarks upon them, which may be found in the votes of the time, and in the historical review I afterward published but between us personally no enmity arose. We were often together, he was a man of letters, had seen much of the world, and was very entertaining and pleasing in conversation. He gave me the first information that my old friend, Jason Randolph, was still alive, that he was esteemed one of the best political writers in England, and been employed in the dispute between Prince Frederick and the King, and had obtained a pension of three hundred a year, that his reputation was indeed small as a poet, Pope having damned his poetry in the Duncanade, but his prose was thought as good as any man's. Begin footnote. A quarrel between George the Second and his son Frederick, Prince of Wales, who died before his father. A satirical poem by Alexander Pope directed against various contemporary writers. End of footnote. The assembly finally finding the proprietary obstinately persistent in menacing their deputies, and with instructions inconsistent not only with the privileges of the people, but with the service of the crown, resolved to petition the king against them, and appointed me their agent to go over to England, to present and support the petition. The house had set up a bill to the governor, granting a sum of sixty thousand pounds for the king's use, 
ten thousand pounds of which was subject to the orders of the then general lord Loudon, which the governor absolutely refused to pass in compliance with his instructions i agreed with captain morris of the packet at new york for my passage and my stores were put on board when lord Loden arrived at philadelphia expressly as he told me to endeavour an accommodation between the governor and the assembly that his majesty's service might not be obstructed by their dissensions accordingly he desired the governor and myself to meet him that he might hear what was to be said on both sides we met and discussed the business in behalf of the assembly i urged all the various arguments that may be found in the public papers of that time which were of my writing and were printed with the minutes of the assembly and the governor pleaded his instructions the bond he had given to observe them and his ruin if he disobeyed yet seemed not unwilling to hazard himself if lord Loudon would advise it this his lordship did not choose to do though i once thought i had nearly prevailed with him to do it but finally he rather chose to urge the compliance of the assembly and he entreated me to use my endeavours with them for that purpose declaring that he would spare none of the king's troops for the defence of our frontiers and that if we did not continue to provide for the defence ourselves they must remain exposed to the enemy i acquainted the house with what had been passed and presenting them with a set of resolutions i had drawn up declaring our rights and that we did not relinquish our claim to those rights but only suspended the exercise of them on this occasion through force against which we protested they at length agreed to drop that bill and frame another comfortable to the proprietary instructions this of course the governor passed and i was then at liberty to proceed on my voyage but in the meantime the packet had sailed with my sea stores which was some loss to me and my only recompense was his lordship's thanks for my service all the credit of obtaining the accommodation falling to his share he set out for new york before me and as the time for dispatching the packet boats was at his disposition and there were two then remaining there one of which he said was to sail very soon i requested to know the precise time that i might not miss her by any delay of mine his answer was i have given out that she is to sail on saturday next but i may let you know and through announce that if you are there by monday morning you will be in time but do not delay longer by some accidental hindrance at a ferry it was monday noon before i arrived and i was much afraid she might have sailed as the wind was fair but i was soon made easy by the information that she was still in the harbour and would not move till the next day one would imagine that i was now on the very point of departing for europe i thought so but i was not then so well acquainted with his lordship's character of which indecision was one of the strongest features i shall give some instances it was about the beginning of april that i came to new york and i think it was near the end of june before we sailed there were then two of the packet boats which had been long in port but were delayed for the general's letters which were always to be ready to-morrow another packet arrived she too was detained and before we sailed a fourth was expected ours was the first to be dispatched as having been there the longest passengers were engaged in all and some extremely impatient to be gone and the merchants uneasy about their letters and the orders they had given for insurance it being war time for fall goods but their anxiety availed nothing his lordship's letters were not ready and yet whoever waited on him found him always at his desk pen in hand and concluded that he must needs write abundantly going myself one morning to pay my respects i found in his antechamber one innes a messenger of philadelphia who had come from thence express with a packet from governor denny for the general he delivered to me some letters from my friends there which occasioned my inquiry when he was to return and where he lodged that i might send some letters by him he told me he was ordered to call to-morrow at nine for the general's answer to the governor and should set off immediately i put my letters into his hand that same day a fortnight after i met him again in the same place so you are soon returned innes returned no i am not gone yet how so i have called here by order every morning these two weeks past for his lordship's letter and it is not yet ready 
is it possible when he is so great a writer for i see him constantly at his escritoire yes says innes but he is like st george on the signs always on horseback and never rides on this observation of the messenger was it seems well founded for when in england i understood that mr pitt gave it as one reason for removing this general and sending generals amherst and wolfe that the minister never heard from him and could not know what he was doing Again, footnote william pitt first earl of chatham seventeen o eight to seventeen seventy eight a great english statesman and orator under his able administration england won canada from france he was a friend of america at the time of our revolution End of footnote. this daily expectation of sailing and all the three packets going down to sandy hook to join the fleet there the passengers thought it best to be on board lest by a sudden order the ship should sail and they be left behind there if i remember right we were about six weeks consuming our sea stores and obliged to procure more at length the fleet sailed the general and all his army on board bound to louisburg with the intent to besiege and take that fortress all the packet boats in company ordered to attend the general's ship ready to receive his dispatches when they should be ready we were out five days before we got a letter with leave to part and then our ship quitted the fleet and steered for england the other two packets he still detained carrying them with him to halifax where he stayed some time to exercise the men in sham attacks upon sham forts then altered his mind as to besieging louisburg and returned to new york with all his troops together with the two packets of above mentioned and all their passengers during his absence the french and savages had taken fort george on the frontier of that province and the savages had massacred many of the garrison after capitulation i saw afterwards in london captain bonnell who commanded one of those packets he told me that when he had been detained a month he acquainted his lordship that his ship was grown foul to a degree that must necessarily hinder her fast sailing a point of consequence for a packet boat and requested an allowance of time to heave her down and clean her bottom he was asked how long that would require he answered three days the general replied if you can do it in one day i give leave otherwise not for you must certainly sail the day after to-morrow so he never obtained leave though detained afterwards from day to day during full three months i saw also in london one of bonnell's passengers who was so enraged against his lordship for deceiving and detaining him so long at new york and then carrying him to halifax and back again that he swore he would sue him for damages whether he did or not i have not heard as he represented the injury to his affairs it was very considerable on the whole i wondered much how such a man came to be entrusted with so important a business as the conduct of a great army but having since seen more of the great world and the means of obtaining and motives for giving places my wonder is diminished general shirley on whom the command of the army devolved upon the death of braddock would in my opinion if continued in place have made a much better campaign than that of loudon in seventeen fifty seven which was frivolous expensive and disgraceful to our nation beyond conception for though shirley was not a bred soldier he was sensible and sagacious in himself and attentive to good advice from others capable of forming judicious plan and quick and active in carrying them to execution loudon instead of defending the colonies with his great army left them totally exposed while he paraded idly at halifax by which means fort george was lost besides he deranged all our mercantile operations and distressed our trade by a long embargo on the exportation of provisions on pretense of keeping supplies from being obtained by the enemy but in reality for beating down their price in favour of the contractors in whose profits it was said perhaps from suspicion only he had a share and when at length the embargo was taken off by neglecting to send notice of it to charlestown the carolina fleet was detained near three months longer whereby their bottoms were so much damaged by the worm that a great part of them foundered in their passage home begin footnote this relation illustrates the corruption that characterized english public life in the eighteenth century it was gradually overcome in the early part of the next century End footnote. 
surely was i believe sincerely glad of being relieved from so burdensome a charge as the conduct of an army must be to a man unacquainted with military business i was at the entertainment given by the city of new york to lord loden on his taking upon him the command surely though thereby superseded was present also there was a great company of officers citizens and strangers and some chairs having been borrowed in the neighbourhood there was one among them very low which fell to the lot of mr shirley perceiving it as i sat by him i said have they given you sir too low a seat no matter says he mr franklin i find a low seat the easiest while i was as aforementioned detained at new york i received all the accounts of my provisions etc that i had furnished to braddock some of which accounts could not sooner be obtained from the different persons i had employed to assist in the business i presented them to lord loudon desiring to be paid the balance he caused them to be regularly examined by the proper officer who after comparing every article with its voucher certified them to be right and the balance due for which his lordship promised to give me an order on the paymaster this was however put off from time to time and though I called often for it by appointment, I did not get it. At length, just before my departure, he told me he had, on better consideration, concluded not to mix his accounts with those of his predecessor. And you, says he, when in England, have only to exhibit your accounts at the Treasury, and you will be paid immediately. I mentioned, but without effect, the great and unexpected expense I had been put to by being detained so long at New York as a reason for my desiring to be presently paid and on my observing that it was not right i should be put to any further trouble or delay in obtaining the money i had advanced as i charged no commission for my service sir says he you must not think of persuading us that you are no gainer we understand better those affairs and know that every one concerned in supplying the army finds means in the doing it to fill his own pockets i assured him that was not my case, and that I had not pocketed a farthing, but he appeared clearly not to believe me. And, indeed, I have since learnt that immense fortunes are often made in such employments. As to my balance, I am not paid it to this day, of which more hereafter. Our captain of the packet had boasted much before we sailed of the swiftness of his ship. Unfortunately, when we came to the sea, she proved the dullest of ninety-six sail, to his no small mortifications after many conjectures respecting the cause when we were near another ship almost as dull as ours which however gained upon us the captain ordered all hands to come off and stand as near the ensign staff as possible we were passengers included about forty persons while we stood there the ship mended her pace and soon left her neighbor far beyond which proved clearly that our captain suspected that she was loaded too much by the head the casks of water it seemed had been all placed forward these were therefore ordered to be moved further aft on which the ship recovered her character and proved the best sailor in the fleet the captain said he had once gone at the rate of thirteen knots which is accounted thirteen miles per hour we had on board as a passenger captain kennedy of the navy who contended that it was impossible and that no ship ever sailed so fast and that there must have been some error in the division of the log line or some mistake in heaving the log a wager ensued between the two captains to be decided when there should be sufficient wind kennedy thereupon examined rigorously the log line and being satisfied with it he determined to throw the log himself accordingly some days after when the wind blew very fair and fresh and the captain of the packet ludwig said he believed she then went at the rate of thirteen knots kennedy made the experiment and owed his wager lost again footnote a log line is a piece of wood shaped and weighted so as to keep it stable when in the water to this is attached a line knotted at regular distances by these devices it is possible to tell the speed of a ship and footnote the above fact i give for the sake of the following observation it has been remarked as an imperfection in the art of shipbuilding that it can never be known till she is tried whether a new ship will or will not be a good sailor for that the model of a good sailing ship has been exactly followed in a new one which has proved on the contrary remarkably dull 
I apprehend that this may partly be occasioned by the different opinions of seamen respecting the modes of lading, rigging, and sailing of a ship. Each has his system, and the same vessel, laden by the judgment and orders of one captain, shall sail better or worse than when by the orders of another. Besides, it scarce ever happens that a ship is formed fitted for the sea and sailed by the same person. One man builds the hull, another rigs her, third lades and sails her. No one of these has the advantage of knowing all the ideas and experience of the others, and therefore cannot draw just conclusions from a combination of the whole. Even in the simple operation of sailing when at sea, I have often observed different judgments in the officers who commanded the successive watches, the wind being the same. One would have the sails trimmed sharper or flatter than another, so that they seemed to have no certain rule to govern by. Yet I think a set of experiments might be instituted, first to determine the most proper form of the hull for swift sailing, the best dimensions and properest place for the masts, then the form and quantity of sails, and their position, as the wind may be, and lastly, the disposition of the lading. This is an age of experiments, and I think a set of accurately made and combined would be of great use. I am persuaded, therefore, that ere long some ingenious philosopher will undertake it to whom I wish success. We were several times chased in our passage, but outsailed everything, and in thirty days had soundings. We had a good observation, and the captain judged himself so near to our port, Falmouth, that if we made a good run in the night we might be off the mouth of that harbour in the morning, and by running in that night might escape the notice of the enemy's privateers, who often cruised near the entrance of the channel. Accordingly all the sail was set and that we could possibly make, and the wind being very fresh and fair, we went right before it and made great way. The captain, after his observation, shaped his course, as he thought, so as to pass wide of the Chile Isles, but it seems there is sometimes a strong indraft setting up St. George's Channel, which deceives seamen, and caused the loss of Sir Cloudersley Shovel's squadron. This indraft was probably the cause of what happened to us. We had a watchman placed on the bow, to whom they often called, Look well out before thee, and he as often answered, Aye, aye, but perhaps had his eyes shut, and was half asleep at the time, they sometimes answering, as is said mechanically, for he did not see a light just before us, which had been hid by the stubbing sails from the man at the helm, and from the rest of the watch, but by an accidental yaw of the ship, was discovered and occasioned a great alarm, we being very near it, the light appearing to me as big as a cartwheel. It was midnight, and our captain fast asleep. But Captain Kennedy jumped upon deck, and seeing the danger, ordered the ship to wear round, all sails standing, an operation dangerous to the masts. But it carried us clear, and we escaped shipwreck, for we were running right upon the rocks on which the lighthouse was erected. Thus deliverance impressed me strongly with the utility of lighthouses and made me resolve to encourage the building more of them in america if i should live to return there in the morning it was found by the soundings etc that we were near our port but a thick fog hid the land from our sight about nine o'clock the fog began to rise and seemed to be lifted up from the water like a curtain at a playhouse discovering underneath the town of falmouth the vessels in its harbour and the fields that surrounded it there was a most pleasing spectacle to those who had been so long without any other prospects than the uniform view of a vacant ocean, and it gave us the more pleasure as we were now free from the anxieties which the state of war occasioned. I set out immediately with my son for London, and we only stopped a little by the way to view Stonehenge on Salisbury Plain, and Lord Pembroke's house and the gardens, with his very curious antiques at Wilton. We arrived in London the 27th of July, 1757. As soon as I was settled in a lodging Mr. Charles had provided for me, I went to visit Dr. Fothergill, to whom I was strongly recommended, and whose counsel respecting my proceedings I was advised to obtain. 
he was against an immediate complaint to government and thought the proprietaries should first be personally applied to who might possibly be induced by the interposition and persuasion of some private friends to accommodate matters amicably i then waited on my old friend and correspondent mr peter collinson who told me that john halsbury the great virginia merchant had requested to be informed when i should arrive that he might carry me to lord granville's who was then president of the council and wished to see me as soon as possible i agreed to go with him the next morning accordingly mr hansbury called for me and took me in his carriage to the nobleman's who received me with great civility and after some questions respecting the present state of affairs in america and discourse thereupon he said to me you americans have wrong ideas of the nature of your constitution you contend that the king's instructions to his governors are not laws and think yourselves at liberty to regard or disregard them at your own discretion but those instructions are not like the pocket instructions given to a minister going abroad for regulating his conduct in some trifling point of ceremony they are first drawn up by judges learned in the laws they are considered debated and perhaps amended in council after which they are signed by the king they are then so far as they relate to you the law of the land for the king is the legislator of the colonies i told his lordship that this was new doctrine to me i had always understood from our charters that our laws were to be made by our assemblies to present it indeed to the king for his royal assent but being once given the king could not repeal or alter them and as the assemblies could not make permanent laws without his assent so neither could he make a law for them without theirs he assured me i was totally mistaken i did not think so however and his lordship's conversation having a little alarmed me as to what might be the sentiments of the court concerning us i wrote it down as soon as i returned to my lodgings i recollected that about twenty years before a clause in a bill brought into parliament by the ministry had proposed to make the king's instructions laws in the colonies but the clause was thrown out by the commons for which we adored them as our friends and friends of liberty till by their conduct towards us in seventeen sixty five it seemed that they had refused that point of sovereignty to the king only that they might reserve it for themselves begin footnote this whole passage shows how hopelessly divergent were the english and american views on the relations between the mother country and her colonies grenville here made clear that the americans were to have no voice in making or amending their laws parliament and the king were to have absolute power over the colonies no wonder franklin was alarmed by this new doctrine with his keen insight into human nature and his consequent knowledge of american character he foresaw the inevitable result of such an attitude on the part of england his conversation with granville makes these last pages of the autobiography one of his most important parts after some days dr fothergill having spoken to the proprietaries they agreed to a meeting with me at mr t penn's house in spring garden the conversation at first consisted of mutual declarations of disposition to reasonable accommodations but i supposed each party had his own ideas what should be meant by reasonable we then went into consideration of our several points of complaint which i enumerated the proprietaries justified their conduct as well as they could and i the assemblies we now appeared very wide and so far from each other in our opinions as to discourage all hope of agreement however it was concluded that i should give them the heads of our complaints in writing and they promised then to consider them i did soon after but they put the paper into the hands of their solicitor ferdinand john paris who managed for them all their law business in their great suit with the neighboring proprietary of maryland lord baltimore which had subsisted seventy years and wrote for them all their papers and messages in their dispute with the assembly he was a proud angry man and as i had occasionally in answers of the assembly treated his papers with some severity they being really weak in point of argument and haughty in expression he had conceived a mortal enmity to me which 
discovering itself whenever we met i declined the proprietary's proposal that he and i should discuss the heads of complaint between our two selves and refused treating with any one but them they then by his advice put the paper into the hands of the attorney and solicitor general for their opinion and counsel upon it where it lay unanswered a year wanting eight days during which time i made frequent demands of an answer from the proprietaries but without obtaining any other than that they had not yet received the opinion of the attorney and solicitor general what it was when they received it i never learnt for they did not communicate it to me but sent a long message to the assembly drawn and signed by paris reciting my paper complaining of its want of formality as a rudeness on my part and giving a flimsy justification of their conduct adding that they should be willing to accommodate matters if the assembly would send out some person of candour to treat with them for that purpose intimating whereby that i was not such want of formality or rudeness was probably my not having addressed the papers to them with the assumed titles of true and absolute proprietaries of the province of pennsylvania which i omitted this not thinking it necessary in a paper the intention of which was only to reduce to a certainty by writing what in conversation i had delivered viva voce. but during this delay the assembly having prevailed with governor denny to pass an act taxing the proprietary estate in common with the estates of the people which was the grand point in dispute they omitted answering the message when this act however came over the proprietaries counselled by paris determined to oppose its receiving the royal assent accordingly they petitioned the king in council and a hearing was appointed in which two lawyers were employed by them against the act and two by me in support of it they alleged that the act was intended to load the proprietary estate in order to spare those of the people and that if it were suffered to continue in force and the proprietaries who were in odium with the people left to their mercy in proporting the taxes they would inevitably be ruined we replied that the act had no such intention and would have no such effect that the assessors were honest and discreet men under an oath to assess fairly and equitably and that any advantage each of them might expect in lessening his own tax by augmenting that of the proprietaries was too trifling to induce them to perjure themselves this is the purport of what i remember as urged by both sides except that we insisted strongly on the mischievous consequences that must attend a repeal for that the money one hundred thousand pounds being printed and given to the king's use expended in his service and now spread among the people the repeal would strike it dead in their hands to the ruin of many and the total discouragement of future grants and the selfishness of the proprietaries in soliciting such a general catastrophe merely from a groundless fear of their estate being taxed too highly was insisted upon in the strongest terms on this lord mansfield one of the council rose and beckoning me took me into the clerk's chamber while the lawyers were pleading and asked me if i was really of the opinion that no injury would be done the proprietary estate in the execution of the act i said certainly then says he you can have little objection to enter into an engagement to assure that point i answered none at all he then called in paris and after some discourse his lordship's proposition was accepted on both sides a paper to the purpose was drawn up by the clerk of the council which i signed with mr charles who was also an agent of the province for their ordinary affairs when lord mansfield returned to the council chamber where finally the law was allowed to pass some changes were however recommended and we also engaged they should be made by a subsequent law but the assembly did not think them necessary for one year's tax having been levied by the act before the order of the council arrived they appointed a committee to examine the proceedings of the assessors and on this committee they put several particular friends of the proprietaries after a full inquiry they unanimously signed a report that they found the tax had been assessed with perfect equity the assembly looked into my entering into the first part of the engagement as an essential service to the province since it secured the credit of the paper money then spread over all the country 
they gave me their thanks in form when i returned but the proprietaries were enraged at governor denny for having passed the act and turned him out with threats of suing him for breach of instructions which he had given bond to observe he however having done it at the insistence of the general and for his majesty's service and having some powerful interest at court despised the threats and they were never put in execution unfinished end of chapter nineteen